All right, good morning. Let's take our Bibles together and open to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're making our way through the book 1 Corinthians, and uh, it is a context in the first century in the city of Corinth that a letter was written to a nascent church that had just begun and was um, learning how to follow Christ as a church in a very pagan culture. And we find some similarities of the issues that they were facing and the issues of our present world. Today is a particularized problem that the Apostle Paul is addressing in chapter six, but it does reveal to us one of the common themes of Paul is that he is always calling the church to have what I would describe as an over the horizon vision for life to see the present in some measure, but to always have your eyes on the larger understanding of the world in the present sphere, in our current sociological and political world, and ultimately the world that is to come. And it is the Christian who is able to look an over the horizon kind of vision that makes sense of the present, or if not make sense of it, um, endure it, knowing that the present world is going to be gathered up into the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will rule forever and ever, and everyone said, that's what's coming. So Paul has to keep telling a people in a pagan world, keep your eyes on Jesus. Who are you? And Who were you before him? We've already seen that the people in Corinth have grown up with a human kind of wisdom that characterized all of their life before they knew Christ. And there was squabbling all around them that Paul addressed in the early chapters that they were preferring one leader over another. And so there was constant conflict and petty fighting between them. Who am I going to follow? Who's the better leader? And clearly they, because of that, were critical of each other. They were probably envious of each other and they had their disagreements about which clique in the church was the in group. Can you imagine such a thing? So glad that doesn't happen here. But they were used to that. And the offenses that they experienced may have been real. um, And therefore they kicked it up a gear. And apparently what they began to do in their quarreling is they took each other to court. And they began to sue each other over perhaps financial issues, the the word defrauding is used in our text this morning, so probably there were economic considerations that they were not settling their squabbles, but taking each other into the secular courts. Maybe they had started a business together, maybe they had provided a loan and they weren't getting repaid. Can you imagine anything like that? Maybe they bought a house together. Uh, We don't know exactly all the situations, but we're going to learn that this is exactly what they were doing. This is a chapter on settling disputes in the church. There is no remedial discipline to the church, as we saw last week. There was a discipline issue that was levied last week for the issue we covered. Not here. What Paul has in mind here is a culture change for the people in the church, to think about who they are and who we are corporately as a church that will inform then how you settle disputes within the body of Christ. So this is is informative for us. I'm not aware of a lot of lawsuits that are going on right now in our church, but many of you have been a part of a lawsuit. It's a very painful experience. And Paul's going to bring them um, to attention to something that he wants them to know. So I'm going to begin in verse 1, where Paul says, When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous 
instead of the saints. It's the problem of these lawsuits and disputes that they had with one another, which apparently were reciprocal, and they were rushing to go to the court system. The unrighteous in verse one, I circled that, that is a, simply a reference to indicate a non-believer. So you're a Christian in a church and you're taking your dispute with another believer into a court that is judged by a non-believer. What Paul is implying is a very high view of the church. A high view of the church being the place in which those who are a part of it have become righteous through the grace of Jesus. They are holy in their life. And um, now they have a grievance and they're taking it out to the courts in order to settle it. Um, So you go to law. That's um, creating a lawsuit against someone because you expect there to be some punishment or retribution that will be carried out, a decision made, a verdict arrived at that will be for your favor and against someone else who is also a part of the church. Paul calls this to their attention and um, the context for what he's doing here is saying, do you know who you are? And why would you do such a thing because of who you are, your identity in Christ? should say you should give pause to that. I'm helped in understanding why this was particularly acute for them and perhaps less so for us. But in one commentary, the MacArthur commentary on the book of 1 Corinthians, there's a lengthy section that describes what life was like in Greece, in Athens particularly, but invariably also in the city of Corinth, which was located just 40 miles away from Athens. Again, I just quote a little bit. The legal system in Corinth was very likely um, much like that of Athens. Uh, There was litigation that was a part of everyday life, having become sort of a form of challenge and even entertainment in their life in Athens and probably in Corinth. One ancient writer claimed that in a manner of speaking, every Athenian was a lawyer. When a problem arose between two parties um, that they could not settle between themselves, the first recourse was private arbitration. Each party was assigned a disinterested private citizen who served as an arbitrator for both sides. And those two, along with a neutral third person, would attempt to resolve the problem. And if they failed to resolve the dispute, the case was brought before a court of 40 who assigned a public arbitrator to each party and then it was attempted to be resolved. It's interesting that every citizen in Greece had to serve as a public arbitrator during the 60th year of his life. In public arbitration, if that failed, the case went to a jury court which was composed of from several hundred to a couple thousand jurors who would hear the case and then resolve it. So you can see this is just like part of the, the soup of life in Greece. Every citizen over the age of 30 was subject to serving as a juror. So either as a party to a lawsuit or as an arbitrator assigned by the court or as a juror, most citizens in Athens and probably in Corinth were regularly involved in legal proceedings of one sort or another. So it's not surprising how you could see this carried on into the life of the church that it would just become a part of the way we resolve problems. That's the way we've always done it. When you think about the Jews and the way in which they resolved their difficulty for centuries, they always settled their disputes among themselves privately or at the synagogue. In fact, most Jews refused to take their problems to pagan courts, believing that to do so would imply that God and his scriptural principles were not sufficient to solve the problems of God's people. It was considered a form of blasphemy to go to court before Gentiles for the Jews all through antiquity and also in the first century. And that's why both Greek and Roman rulers in the time of 
biblical Christianity in the first century allowed the Jews to adjudicate their own problems and solve their cases of legal matters um, in Palestine and outside of Palestine. And under Roman law, the Jews could try virtually every offense that came and then apply any sentence that they wanted to except for death. Now your mind is thinking and you're remembering that from Jesus' trial, the Sanhedrin was able to try Jesus and accuse him of whatever they wanted unjustly and then to put him in prison and to beat him. But the one thing they couldn't do was kill him. So they had to apply to the authority of Rome and to Pilate in order for that to be taken place. All of that's just a little bit of background about how intense and litigious, can you imagine living in a litigious society? Sure you can, you get it. And Paul is saying, when you have a grievance against another, do you dare go to the unrighteous instead of before the saints? He's actually making and establishing a rule for the church that you must try to settle all of your grievances within the fellowship of the church, not merely sweeping them under the rug because offenses are real and transgressions are real, but you should try to resolve them within the church. And his rationale is in the verses that follow. Verse two, do you not know that saints will judge the world. And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? There's a couple things to notice here. Um, Obviously he says, don't you know, he's making an argument from the, a major to a minor, from the greater to the lesser, you as followers of Christ are somehow in the future going to participate in judging the world and in judging angels. So let's just think about that for a moment. When Jesus was with his disciples, he said to them, truly I say to you in the new world when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, speaking to his 12 disciples, Disciples, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Somehow, he said to his followers, you're going to occupy some role in the coming kingdom where you will have authority over others. Now that was for the 12, but in the book of Revelation, it does also say in chapter 20 that John's vision saw thrones and seated on them were those who had authority to judge. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, for those who had not worshiped the beast or its image, who had not received the mark on their foreheads or hands, and they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's the book of Revelation saying that the saints of all time are going to be resurrected and they're going to reign in in some way with Christ and rule with Christ. To the church at Thyatira in chapter 2 in Revelation, Jesus said, the one who conquers and keeps my words to the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but I do know that when we're in heaven, we're going to have some ruling capacity under the authority of Jesus because we are joint heirs with Jesus and Jesus is the king forevermore. We're going to reign with him forever. I don't know what it will look like, but Paul's argument is, don't you know that when you get in that over-the-horizon vision, you're going to be in heaven with Jesus ruling? Can't you settle a trivial pursuit here? And you're going to judge angels. There's less said about that. Is it the fallen angels whom Jesus will judge and will be with him around that judgment of fallen angels? Elect angels, holy angels are not going to be judged as if they had sin in them, but the word judge could also mean to govern or to rule over. So will we have some rulership over the angels? Paul seems to think that in the life to come, 
We're going to have some capacity because we're in Christ to rule, to judge. And so his point is, if that's true, why can't you settle a dispute here among you? Now look at what he says. Um, if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent, incompetent to try what kind of cases? There's a, f- a reference here, it seems to indicate that there is a trivial case And in verse three, matters pertaining to this life, which I think Paul is saying, not life or death, but trivial matters of this life. And whatever was going on in the church, they were um, arguing like crazy with each other and rushing off to judges who were not Christians and airing out all of their problems in the court. Paul's argument is you should be able to settle this among yourselves. Verse four, so if you have such cases, and you know, every, every lawsuit is trivial unless you're in it, right? <laughs> every, every dispute is, uh, oh, come on, get over it, unless it's you, and then it's something. But Paul says, if you have such cases as this, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? Um, So, grievances, trivial matters, and these kind of matters. Verse five, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? You can see what Paul is arguing here is you're related in the family to each other. Four times in three in these verses and then again in verse seven, you see the word brother. That's his argument. His rationale is you are family together. You should be able to resolve this. The resolution may come by having the elders of the church, other Christian men and women, come to reconcile two people rather than rushing out and resolving it in the presence of a court system. Can't this be seen as an extension of the Matthew 18 prescription of when your brother sins against you and you have something against them, your sister has transgressed against you, go to her and try to resolve it. And if you can't resolve it, then bring another person with you. And if you can't resolve it, then bring the whole weight of the church against it. I I think that's one way to think about these. How you doing? I wanna make something really clear to you though. Um, The legal court system is in, in a sense ordained by God even if it's ruled by pagan. The words used for the judges here are the unrighteous because they're not generally Christian. And um, they have no standing in the church. But we should add, and I I want you to hear me say clearly that this does not preclude... um, imagining that criminal cases that occur within the life of the church should be kept from the legal system in the society in which you might find yourself. The laws of the land require that criminal matters be adjudicated within the court system and our society contains certain laws that require every citizen of the United States to bring to secular courts matters that must be resolved, disputes in custody, in some cases of divorce, in case of abuse or neglect, even property disputes that include legal deeds that have to be resolved in a court system in order to comport with the law. So we're, we're not saying that those things would be hidden in the church and not brought before legal grounds in, in the court system within the society that we live. Everybody got that? I'm getting the sense that what Paul's saying here is these are trivial matters that you should be able to resolve, but 
in some cases, the court system is exactly what God has ordained to resolve criminal and certain legal matters, and we should avail ourselves to that. Don't think that's what he has in mind here because of the repeated use of the word brother in verse 5, and then again in verse 7. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you, that you have to go do that. Why not And then here is the little over the horizon mentality, a cultural shift in verse seven. Why not rather suffer wrong? And everybody said, hmm. You see what he's saying, why not suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? It would be better to suffer loss than to rush to a court and bring your case before an unrighteous judge. But you yourselves are already wrong and you defraud even your own brothers. And here's a principle that is sort of uh, Paul trying to create a DNA for the church that I would be willing to suffer loss rather than to bring embarrassment on the church by bringing a trivial matter into litigation before the court system when we should be able to resolve it here and if it can't be resolved, I'll suffer loss instead. And if I were you, I'd be sitting there, we'll say, up to how much? (laughs) What would be the threshold? And I, I think that you just have to pray about that and say, Lord, what would be the right, right thing for me to do here? I'm gonna go to my church, see if I can get this resolved in the church. But Paul is saying, let yourself be wronged. Better to be wrong than to run off into, um, into court. And I would just say, because we're proceeding this morning toward communion, in which we remember Jesus and his life and his death for us, Um, Let me see if I can lead you. What Paul is arguing is that if you are a follower of Jesus, you have an internal desire to walk in the steps of Jesus. And we are invited to do that in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. What steps? He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he didn't threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus left the glory of heaven to take on human form in a great, condescension to become human. In his humanity, he was mistreated throughout his lifetime and never returned evil for evil and invites us to live in the same way. He went all the way to the cross and was crucified, innocent though he was, and then without reviling anyone who did that, he says, you should walk in my steps. So Paul's words... Let yourself be wronged rather than take this into the court system to be resolved. It's trivial. Conflict among the believers was spilling out and destroying the reputation. The idea is not suddenly that the church will begin to function in a legal way to be seen by the societal courts as on a, on a par, but these church mediators who are called upon to resolve conflicts between people within the church should be in the best position because of their faith in Jesus and their knowledge of grace and virtue and what it means to be a mature Christian should be able to resolve those. Who should know about justice? but people within the church who should know about mercy and grace and forgiveness and pardon and restitution and what is right. And so Paul is saying the the believers in the church have a grounds by which with the biblical principles of what it is to be just and merciful, forgiving and kind should have the platform by which they could help two brothers, a brother and a sister resolve their conflict together. None of us want pure justice. 
If we asked for pure justice for ourselves, um, we'd be in trouble. Jesus didn't get it from Pilate. Paul didn't get it from the courts in Jerusalem. Um, the facts that they had these quarrels was already a defeat for them. So again, I met with a lawyer this week, um, not about any of you, <clears throat> but settling my, um, you know, my estate planning. And I asked him about, Have you, do you read the Bible? And he said, yeah, I do read the Bible. And I said, um, have you done any work in the book of First Corinthians in chapter six? I have to preach on it Sunday and I'd, I'd like your opinion. Uh, he was unable <laughs> to provide anything. But I'm thankful that I found this quote from um, Associate Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia who made this observation. And frankly, I'm glad that some of the Supreme Court justices read the Bible. But this is what he said. I think that this passage has something to say about the proper Christian attitude towards civil litigation. Paul is making two points. Paul says that the mediation of a mutual friend such as the parish priest should be sought before parties run off to law courts. I think we are too ready today to seek vindication and vengeance through adversarial proceedings rather than peace through mediation. Good Christians, just as they are slow to anger, should be slow to sue. I like that. Would that all justices would have that. I, I think what Paul is saying, your brothers, your family together, you should be careful about doing that. Don't, don't bring the reputation of Christ into this way. Because I know who you are now in Christ. So we've read about the judges. They are described as unrighteous because they're not Christian in most cases, though we have many judges who are Christian. They have no standing in the church, the secular judges, and they are not believers, verse seven says. So now what Paul's gonna do in verse nine, he's gonna say, so let me talk about who you are, church. Who you are. That's the way the, the world system is. Unrighteous, no standing in the church, and unbelievers. And then in verse nine he says, or do you not know that the unrighteous, probably referring to the ones that they're going to to solve their problems, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. And then he creates a list that is not exhaustive, but it's helpful. That neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That is, that someone who is characterized by this not exhaustive list of sin, and that is who they are, does not have a part in the kingdom of God. And so you're taking your, your lawsuit before those who have no standing, they are unrighteous. That's what he's making the comparison to. And don't you know that all who are this, these things, have no standing in the kingdom of God. Your vision is over the horizon to the coming kingdom of God. So who were you before you came to Christ? Are you on that list? I'm on that list. Are you on that list? Yeah, we're all on that list. And if it's not on that list, it's another list, but it, it belongs there. It's who we were before Jesus. And the weight of this argument is I know who you are now. That's who you used to be. As we prepare to go to communion, you look at that list and you say, I see myself on that list. There's nothing on that list or any other list that is beyond the grace of Jesus. Nothing you have done is outside of his forgiving grace manifest in the death of Christ on the cross. And that's why the best verse in this section is verse 11. And such were some of you. Everybody said, that's what you used to be. Such were some of you. I love that about the Corinthian church. 
They were gathered together in worship, and they could look back over the, the past horizon and say, I know what I used to be, but I came to Christ, and I know who I am now. Why? Because you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, just three quick notes about these words. The word washed here is the idea of being totally cleansed, being um, submersed. (laughs) Baptism is a good picture of it, to be cleansed on the inside to such an extent that you are born again. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, Uh, Verse four says, when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the works that we did in righteousness, but by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Christ our Savior. And part of the language is that when you believe in Jesus, a spiritual reality occurs on the inside of us that we are washed clean of our sins and our sins are forgiven yeah they're forgiven so that the psalmist could say in psalm 51 you should read that and study it this week it says wash me thoroughly from my iniquity cleanse me from my sin purge me with hyssop and i'll be clean wash me and i'll be whiter than snow create a clean heart in me O god and renew a right spirit within me. This is what Jesus does. He cleanses us from all of our sin and it's never held against us again. That's who you are in Christ. And you're sanctified. The word is, as we've said over and over again, it means to be set apart. You're in his family. You're reserved for him. You're made holy. It's a positional kind of thing and then we try to progress in our conduct in sanctification. It means to belong to him as a new creature and you're justified. And what a great word in this context of legal disputes. You are declared righteous. The judge of all judges has said you are righteous and the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you that's not who you used to be but it's who you are now Romans 4 would lead us to that but we don't have time do you get that his argument is I know who you are now I know who you used to be but I know who you are now and what a great way for us to proceed um, from this contemplation to the Lord's table Allow yourself to be wronged as our Savior was wronged. In every case, the Lord give you wisdom and ask a wise person in your life. But the -the over-the-horizon vision is we walk in the steps of Christ who gave himself up for us. And now we're going to celebrate that. Maybe the way we would prepare for communion is just to remember who we really are. And if you are sort of relating in your heart to verses 9 and 10 more than verse 11, then maybe as we prepare for communion, you just call upon the Lord. Lord, I, I want those things gone. I pray you'll forgive me. I pray you'll help me walk in the newness of life as a new creature so that as I take this bread today and I drink this cup, I can do it in a way that's worthy of Christ my Savior. Let's pray silently. If you're helping to serve, would you come? Father, I thank you that our new identity because of faith in Jesus is that you see us as washed clean. You see us as sanctified, set apart for your good purpose. You see us as declared righteous in the eyes of almighty God, the judge of all the universe. Would you just help us to rest in our identity 
clinging to Christ alone. You saved us, not by works of righteousness we have done, but by the washing of regeneration. You've made us new in Christ. As we eat and drink today, may our doing so awaken our hearts to praise you, to rest in you, and to appreciate your forgiving grace. And then may you help us live, not pugnaciously, peacefully, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll distribute the bread and then we'll